Let me lighten this up a little bit. It's too tense in here. Uh, when she introduced me, it made me feel like that wicked judge in the Bible about this widow woman. She needed some help. And uh, he didn't care about no one. He was such sufficient within himself. He didn't fear God. He didn't fear anybody. But because this woman kept on nagging at him, <laughs> he decided to do it. <laughs> so I feel like an old wicked judge. <laughs> but I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad they kept nagging on me. Because this has been a, a reflective fulfillment of a longing, a hope, a dream. And you know that is what joy is all about. It is long time expectation. It is the fulfillment of hope. That's what they call it good news. The longest hope in the history of creation was fulfilled 2,000 and 1,500 years ago when some shepherds was out on a the field, these watching over their flock. They was faithful. They was doing what they supposed to be doing in life. And uh, an angel appeared, spoke to them. The fulfillment of longing. This longing had been back there from the days when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. That was a disaster. That plunged humanity into sin and death and violence in the world. And that God longed for us to live together. Lord, he wanted to be in us. He wanted to stay in the garden with us. And he made a promise that someday he would do that. Someday, Emmanuel... God with us, God living among us, God living in us, and that's what the Old Testament is about. It's about that longing, about that waiting. But that night, the shepherds heard it. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. You got to hear that one. Ain't no room in there for bigotry and racism. He had created us from one blood. He created all people to dwell up on this earth. We got something wrong. Something wrong. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. What happened in that Garden of Eden? We became broken people separated from God. We became violent, violent. We went out to build our own cities, to have our own entertainment, to be sufficient within ourselves in life. But he promised us that he would come and he would be a healer. Isaiah talked to us about that. For unto us a child will be born, for unto us a son of given, the government shall be on his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor of the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And we were 700 years before that would begin to break. Job, back there in the days before the Bible, longed for this. In his misery, in his pain, he said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he will stand in the latter days upon this earth, even though a worm might destroy his body, yet in my flesh I will see the Lord. Those angels said to the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. They checked it out. They followed. They went into the city to check it out. And they were able to see that this was real. They found this child in a stable, wrapped in rags. They believed it. They believed it. They believed that this was the fulfillment of the long-awaited Messiah. And this was good news. And they left and 
They in a hurry. They left in a hurry. I think that's what have happened to us. We have lost a sense of urgency. That's what the second coming of Christ was to be, but to be that sense of urgency. We would live with that. Christ was once lifted up to bear the sins of many, and them that look to him, he shall appear the second time uh, on true salvation. And so they waited. And those angels, those shepherds, did what we ought to be doing. What I'm seeing happen, God visiting us and God visiting you here in Oklahoma City. I'm beginning to see a little hope here. We need to go take it, tell it on the mountain. Tell it on the mountain, over the hill. We need to get together. We need to be the people of God. So this is a fulfillment. But today what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about the gospel, the gospel. So let me read you a passage this morning, and then I'm just going to do the explanation here for, for this passage here. It's Romans chapter 1. This is the most comprehensive uh, epistle as it relates to the, the gospel. This could easily be called the, the gospel of God. And what we're going to see here this morning is that we have uh, reduced this gospel. We have taken some of the power out of the gospel. We have taken the very intense of the gospel out. We've taken justice out. Now, we had to do that in order to have slaves. I'm not going to deal with that. Because the enslaved people is the other side of how evil you can be. Because he made the deliverance of his people from Egypt. He made that the symbol, the eternal symbol of deliverance, of salvation. It was not piecemeal. It wasn't that I'd give you one little constitution of peace and then Years later, I give you another one, and now we done discovered another one, and that's reconciliation, and we're about to get to justice in our life. So what I want to do is to look at these holes, and I believe what God is doing is bringing back this incarnation of wholeness so we can preach a whole gospel, so we can take a whole gospel on a whole mission to the whole world. Because we have accommodated bigotry. It's about to get us. It's about to get us. Isaac is cutting off the heads of Christians. I don't know if we have a gospel that is adequate for the problem. I think our gospel have become what the sociologists call pathological. Pathological is when the solution is too small for the problem. We're going down. The solution we have now is too small for the problem. The gospel was supposed to be that power. We're going to see that this morning. We're going to see that this morning. We got to re-examine our, uh, our theological foundation. And we're going to find it's very weak. Very weak. We got to even look at our music. I love this music this morning. We're getting back to it. We're beginning to sing a new song of love and God's power. What we are going with today is a sort of a, uh, a music of sort of somewhat hate. It's sort of represented heavy in my community by the negative rap. There is good rap, but the negative rap. Well, we're making our girls bitches and hoes. Well, we are talking about shooting and killing people in society, and we're not challenging that. Our gospel is too weak to challenge that. The Bible teaches us that we have to examine all things, but hold to that which is good. We have a pathological condition here, and what we are coming with it is too little, too late, too little, too late. It's going to take a group of people who understand that they are called out from the world to be a witness to this world and a gospel that is powerful enough to reconcile black, white, Jews, and Gentile, Spanish, and others together into one body. That's what we're meant to do. We don't believe that. We don't believe that. 
we have a homogeneous type of resistance to the gospel. He sent us to call out people from all races, nationalities into one body so that the world could know we was Christian because of this light that we were shining through us, the light that lights every person that comes into the world in our society. This is the gospel. Let's listen how Paul put it, and you will have reflection upon it, and we'll be finished here this morning. We're going to try to put justice back in it. We just discovered reconciliation maybe uh, a few years ago. Now it's a society issue. And we think if we can drink enough coffee together, black and white, uh, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. And so we have made justice, made reconciliation, white folks and black folks drinking coffee and washing each other's feet. That ain't sufficient. He has shown us, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of us. This is comprehensive altogether to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly before the Lord. He told him, now it's difficult for us to walk humbly if we don't benefit so much about it. That's why we can't deal with rap. There are some young millionaires who are exploiting us with gangster rap in our society. And so they might come by our church so we won't say anything about it because it might offend them. Offending them. But our boys are killing each other. In my community, the highest cause of death in my community by each other is a black boy killing another black boy in our community. And this gospel that we are preaching at our churches is not adequate. That we, 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 if a white person shoot one, we can get emotion, and it ought not be. Ought, ought not, no white person should be shooting. Then it shouldn't be going around. The cops should not be here. They were here to protect us. I understand that. But I understand that life matters. All life matters. That's what the creation was created for, and God gave that management to us and told us to subdue it and use those Resources in order to enhance life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. We care more about the entertainment of life than we care about life itself. Life itself. We are no mess. We, we, we are preaching a gospel that is too light. We're preaching a gospel that got holes in it. Our gospel, our love, is, it's got holes in it. Our charity is not adequate in our society because the problem is pathological. Too little. Too little, too late. So God has got to call out what he did before. He got to call out 12. He got to call out uh, 80. And he got to empower them at Pentecost with 120. And they're going to take on the world. They're going to bring the Roman Empire down. That's what this ought to be about. This ought to be about some people deciding that we're going to move beyond racism and bigotry. We're going to become the people of God, and the world is going to know we are Christians because of the love we have one for another. We have become culture worshipers. We have become culture worshipers, and we've been captured by our own culture. We love our culture more than we love God. Your culture is okay. It reflects how we have come, and it respects our behavior. But, but the gospel is supposed to go beyond culture. They got to hear us speak this love in every tongue, in every language. That's what we're going our way to. That's what we're going to be doing in heaven. They, we are the people that is under the throne in heaven. From every nationality, every color, every race, we are praising God because we have been down here in this world of trouble and we've been calling out, this is us. This is what God has created us to be here. But we are worshiping our tradition, our tradition. God told us to look at what was, to look at what is, but boy, let's make what is to come. Let's make what is to come. Let's make that kind of nation that even Martin Luther King dreamed about. 
that his four little children will one day live in a world where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That's what discipleship was supposed to be. That's why he sends in the world to disciple the nation, so that we could have the courage of our conviction, and we could have some conviction, and we could stand. That's why he put on us all forward armor. Take unto us the whole arm of God that we might stand against the principalities and the power. And having done all to stand, stand. This was our job. The idea today is our commitment is too little. Too little. To, my commitment is too little for the problem. Christ came and he put us on the way. He gave his life for the problem. Then he provided the redemptive grace so we can forgive each other. Let me then read my scripture here this morning. It'll be over when I read the scripture because I'm really trying to explain to you what this scripture here is all about. But this is the message. This is the good news that the shepherd heard. You're going to hear it. Listen at it, what it say. Boy, it sounds like, oh, this is a day. I, I just want to keep y'all encouraged. I think something is happening here. I think the possibility is here. And I think we should treasure. We should treasure. What's your pain? I went to that memorial, and I saw that heard the story that were black children, white children, other children together. When I saw those what looked like chairs and I looked at what you have done since then for the city. I believe that God has broken us up enough. He has opened some wounds that is sufficient to make us look again inside of ourselves and begin to see what is valuable. And in the midst of that, Community development is taking place. Economic development is taking place within this town. Jobs are being created, and they're just beginning in this town. We got to recognize that we seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and a we people will get out there together to give the leadership, to be salt and light. I'm finding that here. I'm finding the signs of that here. People who are thinking about these things and thinking about them creatively in our society. This is a great day. Something happened. Something happened here. And it don't take all. If you start waiting till you get all, you won't do it. All is not going to do it. When people, I go to people city and they say, when we all get together, then we're going to do nothing. I know I don't go back to that city. <laughs> I'm losing my time. I'm losing my time. But when a few people recognize that they belong to God and they belong to each other, and they're looking out for the common good, the common good, that's not just only the individual good, we should see our individual good out of our own creativity in society. But we should be concerned for the poor, the outcasts. That's what a move means. That a move means that you guys are, has medical care for your people. Is that your reach? Th that's one. Do, do one at a time. Do something. Let's become a light. Let our talents show that we can do some things. Yesterday, to bring five universes together with young people who want to be those healers, those wounded healer, healers, who want to go into the society and rescue the perishing and care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. Oh, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity. We're going to have an opportunity if we then become the people of God. If we get rid of some of this foolish racism and bigotry, I make a joke out of it where I go. If I think of that stuff very serious, I'd go crazy. Because it's nothingness. It's nothingness. It's a curse in God's face because God created humanity to bear his face. That's what the image of God is. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing. It has nothing to do with nothing. You can see why I can turn to genocide. It's genocide in my ghetto. 
Just a few weeks ago, one of our young men, 18 years old, killed his father, killed his grandmother. Man, grandmothers in my community has been the backbone. They have been the backbone. They have been as far as you could fall, far as you can fall. And most of our great leaders, that's what we fell in the hand. When my mother died, I was seven months old. I fell in the hand of an old seven-year-old grandmother, had been the mother of 19 children. And she got the five of us, me being the baby, in life. Grandmother, Jesse Jackson, raised by grandmother. Uh, great leaders, Ralph Bunch, raised by a grandmother. Many of our great leaders, that was that grandmother there to tell you, the grandmother now is 30 years old. Because our children, many of them is giving birth in my community, in our clinics, at 13, 14, and 15. And, and we don't know what, the boy, we, they're in jail. They don't have with grandparents much because the girl, the mother is mad because this boy knocked her up. The father is mad because of what happens to his daughter. And, and so we're losing grandparents. We're losing grandparents in our society. We, got some, we need a team on the field. We need a rescue squad on this field. And that needs to be us. That needs to be us. He came into this world to save people like you and I and to engage us into his work here on earth. Let me read the text. Listen to Paul. This is the text. This is the, le the lesson for the day. day. Paul says, first, I thank my God to Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. If you do it at one place, people will hear the sound over the world. The sound will go out. Paul is where he's at in Asia Minor somewhere. And the sound has already gone to this church that he has found long distance, that church at Rome. He had not been to Rome. And he's writing it. This is the headquarters of the imperial government of the world. And he knows if he can plant a seed in that city, that seed can go around the world. He had a commitment to world evangelism. He said God called him. That's what he said to him on that Damascus road. To send him far away to the Gentiles. To turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God. That's our work. And if we do it anywhere, that's why I'm happy to be here. I I'm seeing the possibility. I'm seeing the possibility of a city getting together and forming some little association to bring people together. And people have the resources to help make that happen. And we have the educational institutions coming together in some kind of a coalition so that we can nurture these young folks and get these scholarships and help these young folks to go back to their community with a gospel that is bigger than the problem. Look what he says here. Okay, so he's thinking them. Let me get to the text here. He says, uh, uh, in, in him going to Rome, he was going to Rome to bring some good news, but he was going there to do what I've done here. I came to here to Oklahoma City to share some good news. But when I'm here, I'm encouraged, and this is becoming a mutual thing. See, when you walk out and begin to disciple others, they begin to disciple you. And it becomes mutual. Now we can do this together. And now we can spread it out. The sound will go out from here around the world that there are some people who's concerned about their children, about the dying, about the little one in our society. And we have put together a little entity here, the church. We put that together. That's the call out one. We put that together. Well, boy, we, we don't have many existing churches that can nurture these people. 
This is a new generation. We, we don't know how to practice freedom because we've always been fighting for it. That's what our little book about revolution, uh, leadership revolution. It's a missing point here. It's sometimes we got to stop fighting for something and being something. And we got to be kind, begin to be what we want to, other people to see in society. And that's what the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to be a reflection of the kingdom that is coming here on earth. That's what the church is to be. We're seeking the kingdom. We're kicking the kingdom. And I'm, I'm going to get to this. The gospel is designed to make that. To make that. What are you going to say here? He said, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Paul had a burden for all of God's people. I'm going to send you far away to the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light. And they're going to say at the end, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. We need people who have a vision that has guts in it. We need a vision that got longevity in it. A three-year vision can't do it. A five -year. It took me 18 years to raise each one of my children. 18 years. 18 years. Wasn't no shortcut. Shortcut. We got to commit ourselves to a place. We got to commit ourselves to being, to being. I, I'm going to watch that place because people are always going somewhere looking for the place. You're supposed to participate in making the place. You're present. Wherever you find yourself, yes, God can call us. He can send us. He wants us to go. But we got to be before we go. We're not looking for the good news. We are carrying the good news. Carrying the good news to the world. We are being that which we want to see in society. Now, look what he says here. I'm a debtor. Once you come to know Jesus Christ, and accepted and recognized the debt that he paid for our sin and the grace that he brought with him is adequate for the problem. That's what good. The gospel is adequate for the problem. He says, he's going to say now, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Why is he not ashamed? Because he got the solution to the problem. His message is a little clumsy. That's why he says he's not ashamed. Because that one who came, came to deliver society, the Jews and the Gentiles got together and killed him on a cross, on a garbage dump, outside of the city, outside of the, he was rejected. He came into his own world, his own city, and they rejected him and put him out where they burnt the inside of the animal sacrifice. He was bringing that to an end. And he's going to die out there on that cross, outside the gate. Then he's going to call on you and me to join him out there. To join him out. I talking about buying, getting an airplane that cost uh, $65 million to cure me, make me convenient. And in our ghetto, there's death. We need to join that death outside of the gate. Stand with him. That's what we need to be where there's pain. God brought pain in the center of you, folks. Oh, Lord, I keep praying for those families. But ask God, how can I use this brokenness? How can we use this brokenness to make a better city? And how can we share this with other people around the world? What it took to shake us into our senses. What it take to think of these babies being blasted away by our own people, our own kind the terrorists in our midst, the, the people who are lonely, feel, feel wounded. That's where we need to go. We need to be out there with the hurting in our society. Let me fin finish this. Let me finish this. I'm not ashamed, Paul said, of the gospel because of he's taken the foolish things of the world. 
He don't take the world in that ignorant, not knowing him. That's going to become our redemption. And so they kill him on the cross. But the big deal here is, this is why he's not ashamed. God raised him from the dead and elevated him to his right hand. Far above all principality, they can't get to him again. But he's alive. And the Holy Spirit, his spirit, Christ's spirit, God's spirit came to live within us. We got to get that back together again. Because we have made the Holy Spirit another God. Another God. And most of the time we're lying on the Holy Spirit. Lying on the Holy Spirit. We think we can do that because he's a separate entity. We can still pray to God the Father. But God, the Father, the Son, is involved in every issue of life. Jesus didn't do anything of himself. He is the fullness. He's the fullness of the God, and he's in us. This God who said, let there be light, this is the God who came to live in us. And our leader... Our leader is both in us and at the right hand of the Father, making intercession. I'm glad he's there. I need him. Making intercession for my sin day by day. That's the hardest thing for us to do is to get people to confess their sin. I do that as the head of an organization. I've been doing that. When people sin deeply, and it maybe get another woman or another child while they got a wife. They'll send me to talk to them. I have them one one. Because they will make me common bigger than the problem. So they can justify their own behavior. I can't make people see it. Uh, uh, repent. That's an act of God. God have to do that. God has to intervene. I can't make people humble. I have a difficult time with myself being humble. It takes to humble. I think my wife think that God gave her to me to keep me humble <laughs> in life. You can't humble yourself. You need somebody in your life. You pastors need elders, not just deacons, just to serve tables but deacon there to help an elders, to help us with the content of our word and the content of our character. Uh, we should not be cult leaders, personality cults. We need each other. We need each other. We need the fellowship of each other, the fellowship of our equals, the fellowship of those around us to talk to us so that God can speak to us through them. God wants people to be his prophetic voice. He wants us to be involved in that redemptive work. That's what drives me. What drives me, I think of this little black boy growing up without a mother and a father, poor and poverty, dropped out of school in third grade, and this guy, this God, enlisted me to join with him in carrying this good news to the world. That should be adequate for our pride. That should be adequate for our pride. I'm not ashamed, he says, of the gospel. For it is, it is the gospel. It is what the content of the gospel. Paul deals with that in his epistle in Galatians and all of that. He, he tries to get us to see it is God who loves us, who's living his life out through us. And that we have been crucified with Christ, but we are alive. And our task is to carry this loving message to the world. What does this loving message here look like? Look like? It looks like salvation. It looks like being saved from the past. It looks like being saved right now. I need thee. I need thee. Back to this repentance. You can't give you repentance, but that's when God put his arms around you. That's when God brings everything that he has to a sinner who repents. That's where change is at. And for me, I need him. I need him. You need him. You need him. You need to think of you in the presence of God. 
I like Psalms 1. I can't quite live up to it. I want to be like that tree planted by the rivers of water. I want to not listen to the advice of the wicked. I want to meditate upon the word of God day and night so I can be like that tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. Our leaves shall not wither, but whatsoever we do shall prosper in life. Let me finish this. This salvation. This salvation means I've been saved from the past. It means I'm being saved right now. I need y'all. I'm inspired. I'm going to go home. with. We can do it. I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell other groups like this, we can do it. I, I've seen the spark of it. I've seen the spark of it. I've seen the spark of it. The, the people are coming together. And, and, and they, they're coming together like today. This is an awful day to ask anybody, white folks or black folks, to leave their pulpit at 11 o'clock and come out here. Boy, these are the call out ones here to do the work. So I'm not ashamed. What about, let me conclude here. Let me conclude here. We took the Holy Spirit and made the Holy Spirit a separate energy. He came back to, he came to the church according to the turn of the century. Somewhere along that we was fighting on whether tongues and things should fit into that. And so we lost that. Then he came back again uh, in the 50s. And we went to fighting again over it. And we fight over our issues. And we take our issues and we made them God. Like God, the church can't deal with these issues. Like a voice in the homosexuality and all of these things. I, I'm glad when we was in the civil rights movement, we kept it together for a while. But as soon as we got it out, we went into us a prosperity theology. We went unto us a sing of spiritual, spiritual theology. All you need is a spirit. You need the presence of God. You need the full power of God in our life. So we need to put the spirit back into the Godhead. Back into the Godhead. We need to put it back into the gospel. We need to put reconciliation. We done took it out of the Godhead. And I already said, make it a coffee jet. You, we are making these coffee houses rich. I'm not against the coffee house. I sort of, I sort of like that big one. Which was it the big one? The one, I don't buy their coffee, but I like their behavior. They are sort of Robin Hood. Y'all know the one I'm talking about. That's sort of one that trying to always get the coffee up a little higher, you know, in society. And we done made reconciliation that, that. We need to do what Solomon said. You're my people that are called by my name. Will humble themselves and pray black, white, and all that together. It's hard on us black. Because we go back and look at the damage, and we don't find the strength. But if you would have went to South Africa when I went there, and go back there now, and see what happened. They repented. They came together and let those bad people confess their sin. And they forgave each other. And they got a peace treaty going there. That's exactly what we need. I think that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to turn from our wicked ways. And we're trying to repent. And that God has taken us in. He loves us. I don't care what you've done. All you got to do is confess it to God. He is faithful. He is just to forgive us. Let me finish it. He said, I'm ashamed because of the gospel. What I'm trying to get us to do is to preach the incarnation, to preach a living Savior, that Christ is fully invested in us all at all times, and that we need to proclaim that. That's the sound that needs to go out, that Jesus Christ is alive. 
And he's living his life out in us. And we now are the reconcilers. We are his ambassadors. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And it's given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Let me just give you in closing. Uh, uh, maybe a little model. A little model. We call it the three hours of development. Of Christian community development. You know, really the church should be the center piece within the community. Within the community. And there need to be a church in every community. Rich or poor, there need to be the church there in every community. Uh, I, I think that we got to become absolutely intentional in terms of reconciliation and making these churches multiracial because culture because that can help us. That can help us. This is the first generation in my 85 years where people see value in diversity. This is the first time. We used to have to find something wrong with people that were different. Then we had to give them a derogatory name so we could kill them. If you can give people a bad enough name, you can kill them and not feel guilty in society. We got to change that. We got to see people as created in the image of God and reach out. And we got to love them first. Don't condemn them. Don't start condemning them. And that's what we're doing now. We're taking, we're condemning them and taking their issue. And making that issue God, God can handle these issues. He wants to deal with our whole person in our society. That's the only way we're going to deal with these issues. We're not going to get these issues. In, uh, because we're not going to deal with them by hating the homosexual, by ha hating people who are different. You're not going to get there. And you're not going to build in your program a resistance around them. We got to build some programs of love. The church got to reach out in love, no other way. I don't care how mad you get, that ain't gonna answer the question. Because they see us evangelicals as mad anyway. Anyway. And they see that we are now tacking on things. They will ask, a black will ask, where were you doing the civil rights movement? The natives will ask, where were you when the March of Tears was going on? I don't want that, Christianity, in life. That's why it's urgent that we reach out towards them in love and in compassion. I, I just can't see running them out of the church. I can't quite get there. Because they might run them out of the church one day I'm there preaching. I'm there. You're there that can love them. I could tell you stories. When I would say things like this in churches today, these young people come meet me at the door and they come up and put their arms around and said, I'm struggling with it. Can you help me? And you know, I put my arms around them and touch them and they just break into tears. There's somebody, there's somebody in the church that loves me, that loves me. And I says, what, what is this? The philosophy. Let me get philosophy. I'm finished. I call it the three hours of development. We took those out. We have expanded them now to eight key components. But we call them the three hours. First one is the incarnation of message, living among the people. Now, that don't mean that everybody got to go living among the people. There's got to be missionaries there. There's got to be indigenous people there. There's got to be people who indigenize in there. They're coming back. They're coming back. We just live among the people. Our poem for development is go to the people, live among them, love them, plan with them, learn from them, start with what they know, build on what they have, and of the best leaders like us, you know, the people want to say, we are doing this ourselves. We are doing it together. We don't want our charity to become dependent. We want to lift them out of that into creative good work so we can improve the quality of life of all of our people. That's relocation. Reconciliation is the center. If you don't get God, you don't have the power. God is adequate. God is adequate. 
we are ambassadors to tell people we are representing God and he's bigger than your problem. That's what ambassadors are about for in society. And so we put it back into the gospel. I'm saying we put it back into the initial proclamation of it. Because we don't preach the gospel with hope. We preach the gospel that we're going to be saved from hell. Yes, that's true. But God wants to save us soul, body, and spirit. He didn't just save their spirit down in Egypt and live them there. He brought them salvation. He delivered them into a good land, flowing with milk and honey. We got to strengthen our proclamation. I'm afraid that we are saying, doing what Paul warned us not to do, is preach another gospel. We got to preach a full gospel. The last one, re relocation, reconciliation, and redistribution. Now, when I used to say that, we were still fighting communism. And people said, uh-oh, he's a liberal, left-wing communist because he won't take all the money from the rich and give it to the poor. That would be about the stupidest thing I could ever do. Because the rich would have it back in the next day, the poor would go out and buy Mercedes and Lexus, and white rich folks already got them. That don't make sense. How do we share our resources and our love in a way that people take responsibility for our life? And that's a big thing because if you take responsibility for it, you might see your sin and you might repent. And you might turn to God, and God will help us. God will help us because he brings everything there in our society. We know the problem. We have a solution. We need each other. That's the key. We need each other. We can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to be together with your people. These people. There's a few more than it was at Pentecost where people made that commitment. They was filled with your spirit. And they began to speak to each other. And they created a model of ministry in Jerusalem. No one's in need there for that period because people shared what they had with each other. And they were able then from that to carry this gospel to the end of the world. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but it is the power for the preaching of the gospel is to them that perish foolishness. But to us with our saved, it is the power of God.